some extra mints in the kitchen for you. You have what? Pardon? Some extra mints in the kitchen. Mints? Mint, mints. Okay. For you. Did you see that play I set aside for me? Guessing one too well. Good morning, everybody. Happy Mother's Day to you mothers out there. Yeah, happy Mother's Day. Yeah, you will be one day. So We have a nice service planned for you today. I'm so thankful to see everybody here. And uh, I want to remind all you mothers is that those flowers that are out there on the table, you are to select one and take it home. On the way up. Oh, the ones in the window here? Okay. For the moms. For the moms here. And every mother is to get a flower. And... Uh, so if you don't get one, if we get if we don't have enough, we got more out there. So just let us know. Okay, we should have enough. Okay, I think we do. We have enough. But it's so nice to have the mothers here. What a wonderful day to celebrate mothers. Yes, indeed. We're going to start worship right now. If we can stand together, we're going to start with one called "My Hope Is in You." The title of the sermon today is "It's Mother's Day." We're going to be talking about that. So here we go. Let's sing with a whole heart. My hope is in you.
this wonderful Mother's Day, Lord. I pray that you would just anoint this service and just touch the hearts of everyone, Lord, with a message that they could seal to their hearts, Lord. We're just so thankful that they're all here, Lord. We just love you and are so thankful that you are a, a great Savior you are, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Hallelujah. Praise his name. Thank you. 
knows my name, he knows your name. Sing it. chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions, the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. Praise the Lord. We have so much in the Lord. And it's what, such a wonderful thing for mothers to have the blessing of God in their lives. We're talking about today, we're going to be talking about Mother's Day and mothers and persistent prayer is what we're going to, going to talk about today. But right now it's our time for giving. And if we could have our ushers come forward today and... Uh, we're going to give have our giving and we're going to sing a hymn called Something Beautiful. Oh, 
Well, right now it is time to have Bruce come up here and say a word before we go for our greeting. I just wanted to encourage these fine kids to keep helping me out. They've been doing such a great job. And Micah was uh, a little unsure of uh, what was going to happen last week when we operated <laughs> on him. <laughs> yeah, he was a little bit sketchy about doing this. Come here, Micah. You're on again. You're on again. Yes, you are. You're awesome, and I sure hope you help me some more. I got this for you. This is all of Dr. Bruce's surgery tools. Oh. Yours now. You go heal somebody. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Way to go, Micah. Right now, it is time to stand up and greet somebody and make them welcome as we switch over for the sermon. Children, excuse the Children's Church, so stand up and greet somebody and make them feel at home. Make them welcome to Christ. Let's Mother's Day, and 
we usually have a big crowd on Mother's Day, or we have not that many on Mother's Day, depending on where everybody's going, but I'm glad we have who we have. Very nice. Mother's Day is kind of a lighthearted sermon day, a little different than my other sermons and stuff, but I thought it would be, uh, fits the day pretty good anyway. You know, it makes me think of a story when I think about mothers, about the one day when the little girl was watching her mother do the dishes at the kitchen sink, and suddenly she noticed that her mother had several strands of white hair sticking out, which was in contrast with her brunette hair. And she looked at her mother and inquisitively, and she asked, why are some of your hairs white, Mom? And her mother replied, well, every time that you do something wrong or make me cry or make me unhappy, one of my hairs turns white. <laughs> and she said, Molly, how come Grandma's hairs are all white? <laughs> Good reason. What kind of mommy was that mommy anyway? <laughs> But actually, it makes me think of a different with this Mother's Day. We think about this teacher gave her fifth grade class an assignment and get their parents to tell them a story with a moral at the end of it. Well, the next day, the kids came back, and one by one, they began to tell all their stories. And there were all the regular types of stuff, spilled milk and pennies saved and all these different things. But then the teacher realized that only Janie was left. And Janie, she said, do you have a story to share? Yes, ma'am. My daddy told me a story about my mommy. She was a marine pilot in Desert Storm, and her plane got hit, and she had to bail out over enemy territory, and all she had was a flask of whiskey and a pistol and a survival knife. Wow. She drank the whiskey on the way down so the bottle wouldn't break, and then the parachuted right into the middle of 20 Iraqi troops. And she shot 15 of them with a pistol, and she ran out of bullets, and then killed four more with the knife, and the blade broke. And then she killed the last Iraqi with her bare hands. Good heavens, said the horrified teacher. What did your daddy tell you was the moral of the story, this terrible story? Don't mess with mommy when she's been drinking. <laughs> Well, kind of takes us out of the religious form. <laughs> now we really got to pray. Okay, let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word today, Lord. And I just pray that you would just bless this message, Lord. And uh, just we're just so thankful for the mothers that are here. We're so thankful for mothers in general, Lord. For, for So we just are excited about the message today. And we just are so thankful for all the mothers that are here. And we thank you again, Lord. We turn this service over to you, and we pray that everybody opens their heart and eyes and ears and mind up to receive a message. And we just thank you again, Lord, for everything you're doing in our lives and in this church. And we ask for these things, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And you know, I just thought about something before we start <clears throat> that we have to remember. Alice, I'd like to pray a little one more time and pray for Alice in the hospital right now. She fell on Monday and broke her hip, and she's uh, going in. She had a surgery yesterday. She had, she had to wait that, that amount of time for her vitals to be in the right place. And I'm not sure when she's coming out, but we wanted to pray for her. And also, I wanted to let everybody know what Connie was telling me, that Alice is our main cleaner down here, one of our main cleaners. And we need kind of, if somebody else would kind of step up and help her in her place, you know, on, it's once a week, isn't that right? Well, we were doing it every two weeks. Every two weeks or so, okay. Yeah. And so if there's anybody that would volunteer for that particular thing until at least Alice is better or, or any time, you would never have to stop. We could just split it up because we're always looking for more cleaners that come down on Tuesday morning or Wednesday or something like that, whenever they sat and clean for an hour or two. And so if anybody would be interested in doing that, I'd appreciate it. But let's pray one more time for Alice. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just so thankful for Alice, and she's been such a wonderful person in the church for us, and just such a blessing and stuff, and we just love her so much, Lord. We pray that you would just help her through the hospital, help her through this affliction that she has, the surgery, we pray that the surgery went well, and I just pray, Lord, that you would just bring her back to a safe and sound, and we just thank you, Lord, for her. And so, Lord, we turn it over to you, and we expect good results because she belongs to you, and we thank you, Lord, again, for hearing Hearing our prayer in Jesus' name, we pray. Okay, now for the message. We can think back now 
to certain things that our mom would used to say to us, the obvious things I remember when I was growing up, like pick up your room, do your homework, or take the trash out, or wear clean underwear, and don't forget the classic mom saying, if all the kids jumped off the cliff, would you jump too? You know, we remember this. But today I have a little list of things that mothers would never say. So here we go. Here's a list, okay? Be good for your birthday and I'll buy you a motorcycle. <laughs> How on earth can you see that TV when you're sitting so far back? <laughs> Here's another one mothers wouldn't say. Go ahead and keep that stray dog, honey. I'll be glad to feed and watch him every day. <laughs> Here, here's one. The curfew is just a general time to shoot for. It's not like I'm running a prison around here. Oh. <laughs> Doesn't like that at home. I don't. <laughs> oh, let me smell that shirt. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. You can wear it another week. <laughs> I think a cluttery bedroom is a sign of creativity. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, I used to skip school too, so I understand. <laughs> no, just leave all the lights on. It makes the house all cheery. Ooh. Could you turn the music up a little louder too so I can enjoy it? No, I don't have a tissue with me. Just use your sleeve. If Josh's mom says it's okay, then it's okay for me too. And finally, the last one. Run, hurry, bring me the scissors. <laughs> These are some things that moms would never say. Now, it's been said that God couldn't be everywhere, so he created mothers. Well, of course, that's not theologically correct, but because God is everywhere. But it makes the point that the importance of the influence of a mom. And it's been said that one ounce of mother is often worth more than a ton of clergy. Oh, the importance of mothers. And I suppose we all could think of the impact that your mother or your grandmother, whoever it was that raised you on your life, I wrote down some sayings from certain people. George Washington said to his mother that she was the greatest teacher I ever had. That's what he said. Abraham Lincoln said, all that I am and that I hope to be, I owe it all to my angel mother. That's pretty nice. Here's one from Theodore Roosevelt, the President Theodore Roosevelt. He said this, and I quote, when it's all said, it is the mother and the mother only that is the better citizen than the soldier who fights for his country. The successful money, mother, the one who does her part in raising and training of her boys and girls to be the men and women of the next generation, have a greater use in the community and occupies a more honorable as well important position than any man in it. The mother is the one supreme asset of the national life, and she is import, more important by far than the successful statesman, businessman, or scientist, unquote. Boy, that's pretty good. But they are important. It was Ronald Reagan who said, from my mother I learned the value of prayer, how to have dreams, and how to believe that they would come true. Hmm. Mothers are so important that it just seems so logical, really, to have a Mother's Day celebration. And they are the ones who give all children their first guidance and counsel, and really they can determine, or they're the ones that determine how soon the child can come to the Lord, which is really their main job. And usually early faith is all because of a mother's influence. So many people say, well, I'll just let my little kid or daughter and stuff just choose the faith that they want to choose. But anybody that's born again and saved knows that there's only two ways, only one way to heaven. And there's only two ways to go, the right way and the wrong way. And it's so important that mothers influence their children to believe in God right off the bat. But in all history, all great men, 99% of the time, have uh, just the greatness has stemmed from having a great mother. So often that's true. In the Bible, there's a number of mothers mentioned. And so today, I thought before we would start our main message, a specific story, I wanted to just to look at a few mothers that are in it as we go through it. And so you can know some of these mothers. You can think on them and maybe seek them out yourself. As we start, we see the first mother we had. On your outline, Eve is the first mother, Eve. She had Cain and Abel, and she lost both of them in one day. Cain killed Abel, of course, and Cain was sent away with a curse. Mark on his forehead. 
And so she lost both in a day. And we see later on after the flood in the beginning of the Jewish nation, we saw Sarah, which was Abraham's wife, who had Isaac. His name means laughter. And what joy she had when they had Isaac. Sarah, was, which was, uh, she, she had him after being barren, too. Oh, what a big deal that was. You know, she was been barren her whole life, and she was so old. And sadly, not until after leaning on her own understanding by having her maidservant, Hagar, have Abraham's baby, which was Ishmael, which was a great mistake. God did not want that to happen, but Sarah didn't want to wait. And part of our faith in the Lord is waiting on the Lord, waiting on the Lord. So Hagar and Sarah's slave had Ishmael on your outline. Hagar, Sarah's slave had Ishmael. And he was the father of the Arabic tribes, all the Arabs. They've been a thorn in Israel's side ever since. But Hagar went through a lot for her child. Remember when Abraham told him to leave because these two mothers were fighting over these kids? Sarah and Hagar were fighting over them? And afterwards, it was such a scary time and stuff when Ishmael and his mother Hagar were cast out and they had to go out into the desert. God made a way and gave them water and led them to where they were going. That was a scary time. After that, we saw Sarah's son, Isaac, on your outline. Isaac grew up and married Rebecca. Isaac grew up and married Rebecca. But birthing was hard for her. She had Jacob and Esau. Remember what God said? There's two nations was in her womb. And of course, the nations was the Israelites with Jacob and the Edomites with Esau. Do you remember the story about how they're trading their birthrights for a pot of beans and how later on Esau wanted to kill Jacob? for Jacob getting the birthright, actually. And this is why Rebecca sent Jacob away, because she didn't want to lose both of her kids in one day, the way he did. She really loved Jacob so much, too, that she never got to see him again. But how sad that would be for a mother. Now, Jacob married Rachel, and birthing was hard for her. She only had two kids. Earlier, Jacob was tricked into marrying Leah, Jacob's first wife, tricked him. And uh, Rachel's sister, she had six kids, actually four with her maidservants. So ten kids came from Leah's side. And it was hard for Rachel because she was kind of barren. And Leah was so fertile. And it was hard. Her sister was just getting more kids, and she loved Jacob so much. Rachel and finally had on her outline Joseph. And, but in a few, a few years later, died giving birth to Benjamin. So she died even giving birth. But between those two mothers and their servants, we have the 12 tribes of Israel. 300 years later, we have Joshebed, Moses' mother, as they ran to Egypt to flee the, uh, the drought and everything, and they went there. Can you imagine what she went through, placing her baby in the water to escape the death from Pharaoh? Remember when the Pharaoh's daughter found him and she kept him? She now had a baby, and she wanted to be mother to it. Pharaoh's sister brought the baby to back to Joshua for milk. So Pharaoh's daughter knew that he, she needed somebody, so she found Moses' mother, and then Pharaoh even paid Moses' mother to nurse Moses. So Joshua nursed Moses when she couldn't even keep him. That would be hard for a mother. And she prayed that Moses would, be, would live and have a good life. And just think about the mothers that were in the desert for the 40 years when they were bitten by those poisonous snakes because of the murmuring they did about the manna. Manna, you know, they, didn't, they got tired of the manna. Then they were bitten by these poisonous snakes. And how happy they must have been when Moses made this brass serpent on a stick, which was the sign of the power of the cross that symbolized Christ became sin for us. No, it didn't take too long, though. After just a generation or two before everybody started worshiping that stick, God didn't want that. And that stick became an idol and a stumbling block until good old Hezekiah destroyed it about 500 years later. He had, it said, a good mother. And but then, after Moses and Judges, we see Samson's mother was barren. Samson's mother, Manoah's wife. It was the mother of Samson. But she prayed and prayed and prayed until finally she saw an angel. She wanted a baby so bad. And she told her that she would have, the, the angel told her that she would have Samson on your outline. That she would have Samson. And so it was an answer to prayer after she had persisted in prayer 
But the angel told her to raise him right, make him a Nazarite. That was a sign of somebody that was set apart for God. They weren't supposed to cut their hair. They weren't supposed to drink. They were supposed to just do godly things, and they were supposed to be kind of set apart from society the way God wants all of his church. Not the hair part, though. Of course, I'm a bad influence there. That way I'm going to get a haircut next week. But <laughs> angel told her to raise him right like a Nazarite. And she, the pain she must have felt watching and sh him shrug his responsibilities because Samson was not a good boy at all. He le lived a wild lifestyle. And what a waste it was. God was not happy with Samson. And neither was his mother. What a sad thing. And then we see in the book of Ruth, uh, Naomi had a husband and they went to the Moab and Emily died, her husband. And, and she was the mother of, on your outline, Malon and Chilion. So the first one is Naomi was the mother of Malon and Chilion. Both of her boys died right there of a sickness and they were both just had just gotten married. And they left Naomi, a widow, with no boys which was a tough situation in those days. It, it took a man to be able to get around and do some of the things because of the, such a, they were so um, segregating, you know, with the women and everything. So they lived in Moab, a heathen place, because there was a famine in their own country is why they went there. But Naomi, she was a good, and she was a nurturing mother. And Ruth and Orpah, her daughters-in-law, they were widows now. And both of them wanted to stay with Naomi and stuff. And Ruth had the curse of being a Moabite. The Moabites were when, uh, um, when Lot left Sodom and Gomorrah and uh, his daughters got him drunk and they had a nation out of him and that was the Moabites. And so they were a cursed nation and the Jews didn't really think much of the Moabites and Ruth was a cursed Moabite. However, only Ruth stayed and Orpah went back to be with her parents. But Naomi took Ruth and back to Israel. Naomi treated Ruth like her very, very own. Naomi was a very good mother. And then later on, Ruth became the mother in the line of Jesus, having married Boaz. And Jesus was in the, her line at that time. Here she was, not even an Israelite. And then there's Hannah, who was Samuel's mother, who was barren. Hannah, on your outline, in Samuel 1, she begged God for a child, and she could never get one. She begged him so much that she finally promised that if she would get this child, she would give him back to the Lord. That's on your outline. Give him back to the Lord. She says, if you give me a child, I'll give him back to you, Lord, if he do it. And Samuel means, ask of God. And so she gave him back. And the church raised him because of her promise and stuff. And she would visit him at the church and take him clothes and take him robes and take him things and stuff. So she loved her child and didn't get to raise him. About 150 years later in Kings, Elijah stayed with a widow lady and her boy who thought they were going to starve to death during a drought. But Elijah made an oil bottle and a grain barrel that was almost empty stay that way for over a year. They had been counting on God every day. They must have sang the doxology every time they looked into that barrel because every time they took the last of their food, the next day there was still more there. What an incredible thing. One day her boy got sick and died and Elijah brought him on your outline back to life. But what pain that mother must have felt that day. But then again, what joy must that mother have felt when he rose again. Now after Elijah came Elisha. And during Elisha, there was a widow and two young sons whose husband died, leaving the family with a huge debt. Well, the creditor, knowing that she had no money, wanted her two boys to be sold as slaves for the payment. He didn't want to do that. And so she went to Elisha for help, and he told her to borrow as many oil vessels as possible from her neighbors. And so she took her last pot of oil that she had. She only had one pot of oil, and she filled up every single one of those vessels just enough vessels that she was able to sell it and pay off the boy's debt. She yeah. sold them and all the money that was owed the critter. She saved those boys, but what a trial it was for her and how she had to count on God. She counted on Elisha. Elisha knew it was God. Then in another story, there was a woman who was always kind to Elisha. And she let him stay with them whenever he would pass through the town. Now she had a very old husband and no children, but because of her kindness, Elisha prayed. And on your outline, God gave her a son, and God made her a mother. Well, one day, a few years later, out in the field, her boy's head was hurting, and I think he had an aneurysm or something, right to the point where he died. 
And the mother just didn't know what to do. She came in food. She went and searched Elisha out and found him. And Elisha came back, and on your outline, Elisha healed the boy and brought him back to life. That was sort of like the Elijah story, wasn't it? They both brought a mother's son back to life. What joy for that mother as what the only son would come back to life. And we see Elisha just did twice as many miracles as Elijah. But in this picture, we see how God is the life giver, the life taker. God is in control of life. He doesn't have to give you life. He only needs to just stop giving life. He gives life. He is the one. He is the true one. And it's like a, we come along and we see what a trial these mothers went through. And we see when we get to Kings about Josiah was a good king. At age eight years old, he became king. And he had on your outline a revival at 16 years old. And the Bible says, and I'm telling you, that it was the result of a good, godly mother. We've been covering kings on our Wednesday studies and we see that every king has his mother written down as God explains how every mother has to do with how the son turns out. And so if the son was bad, the mother's name was listed, but if the son was good, the mother was glorified. I think of Mary's mother and her trials, watching her anointed daughter go through all of these, this pregnancy, all this stuff, before she even had a husband. What must she have thought as a mom defending her? Think of her trials. And then finally we get to Elizabeth and Mary. And I bet you they were the happiest mothers in the world when they were told that they were going to have two special anointed children, which was going to be Jesus and John the Baptist. Later on, John was beheaded and Jesus was crucified. But just think about what Mary thought as she watched her perfect son through a mother's eyes be brutally beaten and then crucified on the cross in front of everyone naked. It wasn't easy for her as being a mother. And so we see for every great man in the Bible, there was on your outline a mother that cared. Tell me, did you have a mother that prayed for you? Yes. I did. Before us now, we have the story in Matthew, a story of the persistent mother, what we want to break down and get into our topic and stuff. The mother who had a daughter who was in a desperate situation. And this mother had heard the news about Jesus, and she brought her daughter to the Lord. Now, in her life and in her model, we see an example of the importance of persistent prayer. And this message is not just for mothers, but it's for anyone who wants to pray and seek God answer in the affirmative. Let's go ahead and start. We are in Matthew 15. I forgot to tell you that. We're in Matthew 15, and we're going to read from 21 to 28. And I don't think Don's putting it up. We're in our Bibles on this. I was supposed to have you turn there. I'll give you a second to get there. And then we have some other scriptures that Don has up. And forgive me for that. But here we are in Matthew 15, verse 21. And it says... Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman at Canaan came out of the same coasts and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not me to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O oh, woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Now I'm trying to understand this language and the culture. It kind of looks like from reading this text that Jesus didn't care at first or something. And that Jesus was just unconcerned about this woman's cries and the plight of her daughter. And it almost seems like the Lord is rejecting her. But keep in mind that Jesus' response to this mother is in such a way that he wanted to develop her faith, not destroy it. And you'll see that many times that when you come to the Lord, the Lord just doesn't come like that. And you come again and he asks another question. 
And you keep trying, and then he goes ahead and thinks, you really mean business. He wants to make sure that you're really meaning business. And so this happens many times in the Bible. And we see he wasn't playing games with her, nor was he trying to make an already difficult situation even worse. He was trying to draw her faith out and cause her to rise to the challenge and to stand as an example of a woman who knew how to be persistent in her pleas and to show us how to pray more effectively. Let's consider who this woman was. Let's think about who she was. In verse 22, she, we are told that she is a woman of Canaan. That means she was a non-Jew, which means she's a Gentile. They called the Gentiles dogs. They called them dogs that Jews did and stuff. They felt like Jesus was just for the Jews, and they were the lucky ones. They didn't realize Jesus was for everyone. He just came to the Jews first. Mark says, in Mark, as you look at the same story, that she was a Syrian Phoenician woman. Because of that, she would probably have been a worshiper of the false goddess of fertility, Ashtar. We've been reading a lot about her in the Bible. Also, there were other pagan deities that she would bow before. And so we know that this woman was not raised with the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. She was a woman who had raised with many different gods. And that was very common in this tradition with the people of this culture. She might have had these little idols placed all around their house. They just couldn't get enough gods. They just wanted to ensure their bet and make sure that they were right on. So they prayed to every god. And we know we can't do that with our god. God says he's the only god. Don't pray to other gods. But they didn't know that then. And so she had these little idols all over the house that she'd bowed before. And because of this, perhaps her own lifestyle is where somehow she along the way had invited some satanic influences in without even knowing it. And it seemed that filtered through, down through her and into her daughter, and so much so that her daughter actually became possessed with a demon. In fact, in her own words, it says her daughter was severely possessed. Now, saints, we have the hedge of Job. We have the hedge of Job. And once you're invited the Lord into your heart, that hole is filled. And now you have the possibility of being oppressed, but you can never be possessed if you are filled with the Holy Spirit. And without the Lord, there's that empty place in your heart that can be filled with things and by something or someone else on your outline when the Lord doesn't live there. Get that hole in your heart filled. Ask the Lord to live there and be there and take care of all these satanic problems because he will stand guard at the door and not let them in. And this is to remind us of the importance of the influence of parents because our children are constantly watching everything that we do. And it is so often that it is the parents that teach our kids how to not go to church. They look at their parents that don't go to church that say they believe and they see that God isn't that important to them. They might give God lip service, but when they don't go to church, they know that they're just giving lip service. Otherwise, they would go. And parents teach their children. Children usually start out wanting to go to church. But after they get a little older and their parents don't go to church over and over and over, they think, hey, this is good. I don't want to go either. I just want to stay home. Because that's the easy way. But God wants us to be servants for Him. We need to go and we need to show our children that we care and that it's important to us. And so important that we even pray about it and they watch us pray. The Bible tells us that the sins of parents can be visited upon the children. Now, I've heard, too, that there are such things as a generational curse that may go back in your family, going way back for years. But there is truly a solution. You just need to go to God and just ask Him to break that curse on your family so you don't have to live under it ever, ever anymore. And we have the power of God. However, I don't really believe that the Bible teaches that, that there can be a curse on the whole family like that. And having said that, I certainly do think that there's a great influence from one generation to another. And it has been found, proven by statistics on your outline, that sins are passed down. I mean, if you're an alcoholic, the chances of your kids ending up that way are higher than a child not raised in that environment. If you've been divorced, the chances of your children are much higher than the ones that did not have parents that were divorced. And so you certainly do have influence on your child in more ways than you realize. And so we see that there was something about this woman's lifestyle in Matthew 15 that invited some devilish influence in. And so now she just doesn't know what to do about it. And all you have to do when you have a problem that's too big for you 
is guess what? This is what the Lord is famous for. You take it to him. He's famous for the problems that are too big for us. Those are the problems that you don't have any other hope. When you think you have another way to solve it, God says, oh, go ahead and try. I'll watch you. And we are to pray for him for the answers. But many times the problem is, is that the only time many of us come to the Lord when we have a problem is when the problem is too big for us. Oh, I don't ever have God pray about the little things. Wrong. He needs to pray about everything because the little things become the big things. And usually it's because it stems from you're not walking in the spirit while you fall into these traps. You haven't been listening to God. You haven't been reading the word. You haven't been seeking him with a whole heart. And that usually leads to a lot more problems and probably the big problem that you may be having even today. And besides, when you don't walk with him daily, you're going to miss what God is trying to show you every day. All your opportunities, the guidance that he gives, the places. He opens doors for the ones that you don't think you should go through, and he closes the doors for the ones that you think you should go through. And when you pray, you can go through life smoothly. And God makes sure that he walks with you. I didn't say you wouldn't have trials, but they, you don't have to fear your trials when you're walking with God, because God is plenty aware of everything you go through. But this is where this mother is right now. She's lost. She has no place to turn. And we see that all of her faults, God can't save her. Her religion can't get her out of this mess that she's gotten into. She can't get out of it. But somehow she started hearing about this mysterious rabbi from Nazareth. Rabbi means teacher. Known as Jesus. And she heard about these miracles and she heard of his teachings and healings and she just knew that somehow she had to get to Jesus to get her daughter to him somehow. And God had given her enough light that she knew what she had to do. God gives us light, but then you have to receive it and enter in for the Holy Spirit to enter into you. And so she believed this light that she had and she believed that he could touch her and that he could heal her and she believed that she could get delivered from this evil influence. She believed with her whole heart in Christ. And so she finds him in verse 22 and she cries out, Son of David, have mercy upon me. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. Let's read it there in 1523. 1523. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and beside him, saying, Send her away, for she cried after us. He did not answer her a word. Now, that's tough. Have you ever spoken to someone and have them not answer you? Isn't that rude? Don't you feel like it's rude? They don't even acknowledge your presence. And you say something to them, and they don't even look your way. They don't even act like they even heard you. And you know that they could have heard you, or I mean they should have heard you. And so now, what would your reaction be to something like that? You'd say, obviously, well, I guess they don't want to talk to me. They don't want to hear from me, you'd say. And the disciples saw how Jesus didn't respond to her, so they thought that they should send her away because Jesus didn't want to talk to her because it was apparently quite of a scene that she was making. It sounds like she was yelling very loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is severely possessed, demon-possessed, and she's suffering terribly. And the disciples would say, Lord, do you want to get rid of this woman? She's creating a big commotion. And Jesus doesn't answer. What's the point of all this? What am I trying to say? Jesus could see into her heart. Jesus could see everything about her. And he could see that this woman, that there was a tenacious, persistent faith that would rise to the occasion. He knew she would not go away. He knew how serious it was. She meant business with the Lord. We see, he wasn't putting up barriers, barriers to keep her away, but rather he was trying to draw her closer. He was trying to draw her closer because he knew that she would rally and he knew that she would press on. And that's why he did this. It was to teach those disciples who were often lacking in faith a lesson to give us and a perspective and a mode of how to pray effectively. And you know what? It took a mother to do it. Praise the Lord for mothers and their persistence and their love. There's something that God just builds into mothers that is something so great and so godly. And she just kept pressing on still, just like a mother, seeking Jesus with persistence. And Jesus says, well, it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Mangy curs is what the word was for dogs. They're dirty, oh, filthy dogs. So who are the children? On your outline, it is Israel. That's the children of Israel, the children. What's food or bread? Well, it's on your outline, the Spirit of God or Jesus or the Word of Truth on your outline. 
And who are the dogs? Well, they're Gentiles. The Gentiles, the, the Jews thought the dog, the Gentiles were just dogs because they were going to get the, this word from God. The God came down then for them. They're the special people. And they got prideful and arrogant. And God and Jesus really came for everybody that would choose him. He died for the whole world and saves everyone that chooses him. So he didn't die for everybody and have everybody chosen. He died for everyone, and the ones that choose him are the winners. They're the ones that receive life. But she comes right back after saying all this, and she says, oh, yeah, but even the little puppies, not the mangy curs, but even the little puppy, she says, gets the food that falls from the master's table. And I think that that put a smile all over Jesus' face as she rose to the occasion, rose to this challenge with her persistence, because God wants to be pursued. He doesn't want to be taken lightly. He wants you to pursue him and know he's the answer to all things. Yes. And after putting up a barrier of silence, then the second barrier of seeming rejection, Jesus heard what she wanted to hear, and he makes this alarming statement. Look what he says in verse 28. He says, And Jesus answered and said unto her, O oh, woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Oh, woman, you have great faith. Let it be to you as you desire. Now think of what the disciples must have thought. Their mouths must have dropped to the floor. They, when they heard those words, whatever you will. They, they're going, a moment ago, he wasn't even acknowledging this woman, this lady's presence at all. And he essentially just dismisses her. And it's just because she is persistent and presses on, he shifts gears and says, okay, I'll give you whatever you want, Carpanche. I'll bless you. Go ahead and name it. Just say it. What brought all this about, though? What was it that really made him change his mind there? Well, here is what I want to tell you here. On your outline, this message, we can see why we should pray and how we should pray and the way we should pray to get results. And here it is. Number one on your outline, because of her attitude. Jesus said to her, it's because of your persistence your tenacity and your commitment. And you see, even when they, the door was shut in her face, she just kept right on and knocking because that's a mother's persistence. And when Christ calls her a dog, she's a mangy cur. She just picks up what that little, what he says, like a good puppy and picks up her master's stick and drops it at his feet. And she knows he's the only answer. And Christ wants us all to know he is the only answer. So is that like that for you? Is he your Lord? He is. He is Lord. He is the only place that we can turn. The only place. She had such faith that she simply would not go home without a, on your own, a blessing. She would not go home without a blessing. And she said, Lord, my daughter has a problem and I'm not leaving until it's resolved. You know, I always think of that story. It reminds me of the story of Jacob when he was wrestling with what he thought was an angel. Remember when he came back and the angel was wrestling with Jacob? And later on, he discovered it was actually God himself. And you remember that Jacob was wrestling and he was trying to prevail over the Lord and he realized that he was never going to be able to do it. And finally, he said to the Lord, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. You have to bless me first. And that was the kind of persistence that we need in prayer. That was a physical illustration of how our prayers are supposed to be. I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. Jesus said, knock and the door shall be opened. Seek and you shall find. Ask and it shall be given. And if you were to go back to the original translation, it says, keep knocking, keep seeking, keep asking. And we see this is shown to us in another story when Jesus told the parable of the persistent widow as she pleads for justice. We're going to turn there right now. You don't have to. Don will go up there. He's got this one already. Chapter 18 in Luke, verses 1 through 8. Listen to this quickly. <clears throat> and he speak a parable unto them and to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint saying, there was in a city a judge which feared not God. He didn't fear God, neither regarded man. He didn't fear man either. He's a judge. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him saying, avenge me of mine adversaries, please. And he would not for a while. But afterwards he said unto himself, I don't fear God, nor regard man, yet this widow troubleth me. I will avenge her, lest her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust saith. 
And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Not maybe he makes you wait, wait, wait. And when he does it, he does it speedily. Like the rapture, he will come quickly. Means he's waiting and waiting and waiting. But when he comes, he comes quickly. And so he will avenge them speedily at judgment. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Well, he kind of changes the topic right there. Will there be persistent prayers when he returns? How many intercessors will be there? How many people will be intercessing for other people? Pointed prayers aimed at people to be saved. The rapture is not going to come until the last person that's going to be saved is saved. Is that your neighbor? And we see the idea of persistence in prayers. If someone keeps knocking at your door and they don't stop, you just might finally answer them just to get them to go away. But we must remember that's not how God feels toward us. It's more like this. Because God compares his love for us on your outline as a nursing mother's love for a nursing child. How long does that baby have to cry before he gets your attention? God loves us so much that he wants to hear your prayers and he wants to answer them. But on the other hand, he wants our faith to grow. And he commands us to press on, press on. And many times we give up so easily. And we pray about something for a little bit and it's not answered right away. And we say, oh, well, I guess that's just not God's will. And we go ahead and move right on to another thing. But I say our request can show our real heart's desire. It shows how badly you want it. And that is your heart. What it is you want and how badly you want it. God wants to do business with you, but only if you really mean business. And also, we must keep praying on your outline as an example for others. How are you when you go through a trial? People are watching you. Your children are watching you. This lesson is for us as parents. And so we need to make sure our children see us pray. Now, maybe you have a son or a daughter that has taken a prodigal turn, and maybe they have hit rock bottom before they see their need in God. But just remember what we have learned from these mothers that we've all seen today. Don't give up. Keep praying for them. Keep praying for them. Maybe you have some prodigal parents, and you're praying for a mom and a dad to come to faith, and it seems like nothing has happened. I understand this. That's what happened to me. I prayed for my dad for 25, 30 years. I didn't think it was going to happen. In fact, I just really got so I believed that. But as I was getting more frustrated about it, he finally came to the Lord. I just I blew my mind. But God, it's like that great big rock, and we've got this little tiny hammer, and we can hit it. If we hit it 99,000 times, it'll break. Yeah. So which one are you on? Which one broke it? The 99,000 one? The first one? <laughs> all of them. It takes all of them to break through. But we see that it can happen. However, I have been shown that many people do not get their prayers answered until the very last moment. That sometimes it takes a real affliction. And usually right before people die, they start thinking about things just a little differently. Like, gee, I didn't get to spend all my money. Gee, I should have spent more time with my family. Gee, I should have been doing these other things. I should have prepared this way. But they don't think about it until the last. And basically, we see that uh, prayers don't get answered to the last moment, but God is faithful. But there just so happens to be quite a few thieves on the cross that just lived a life like this, but right at the very last, accept him. And they only figure out that it's all about God at the very end. Well, praise the Lord that they come. But what great service you could be if you accepted the Lord sooner and people could see your life and you could share the Lord with somebody and you would have treasures in heaven. You would have rewards because this is what God wants of his people to share his faith with others. He doesn't want you to just finally get saved in the last and get there. That is a true blessing and lucky thing, but God wants us to have abundant life and the joy that comes from believing in him and knowing that this joy is what brings other people to want to know the Lord too. And God wants us to be servants for him. We were saved to serve. We weren't saved to sit around and wait to die. We're okay now. Eternal life is the perk for doing what God wants us to do as we join his army, his family. We are to share our faith with others. And we know salvation just might come at the very end, but it is our responsibility to share it. So we need to keep praying for these people. 
It may come in a month when you pray for them. It may come in years. It might take years. But even so, it might even come tomorrow. I've seen people that I've went ahead and shared the gospel to, and they immediately just said, I wanted to hear that, and I need this. And so, wow, that's a great thing. And then I've shared it with people that say, I don't want to hear about that Jesus stuff. I've heard about it all my life. So we see people, the same word that turns people on, turns people off. But it's not our responsibility to save anybody. The Holy Spirit does the saving. It's our responsibility to be the Johnny Appleseeds and spread the seed out. Yeah. We don't make it grow. We just spread it around. Amen. We need to always remember to keep praying because even though that person that you're praying for just might escape your presence, I tell you, they can never escape your prayers. Yes. It was Sidney Baxter that said, men may spurn our appeals, reject our message, oppose our arguments, despise our persons, but they are helpless against our prayers. Yeah. Helpless. Amen. Praise the Lord. We need to keep praying and don't give up. We need to be patient and watch God work. Let Him work. Watch Him work. Be patient. Be responsible. However, the devil will whisper in your ear to forget it. He's always doing that. Your situation is not going to change. It's going to stay the same for you. You're not going to change it. And it's been the same and it's going to stay the same. So just forget it. But no, 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 that's not true. He is the father of lies. And God can make a situation in your life that will change your circumstances to where everything can be completely different yes. with prayer and faith. We have learned from this woman the importance of being tenacious and being persistent in their prayers. Secondly, the reason Jesus gave this woman everything she asked for is because, number two on your outline, she got her will in alignment with God's. She got her will in alignment with God's. Remember what he said? What is it that you want? Lady, I'll give you whatever you want. What is it? She said, I want my daughter to be delivered. And so why did, he, why did he do that to her? Why did he give her anything that she might want? Because her will was in alignment with hers and he could see it. And that's what he wanted her to do. And that's what we need to do when we pray. Are you praying for something that's the same thing that God would be praying for? Or are you praying for the lottery? Or are you praying for your vacation? Or are you praying for something else? Or praying for that new car? What are you praying for? Those necessarily aren't God's will. God will give you those things, but He wants you to be in His service first. And it is the point is that I want to say it is not to move God my way. It is to move me God's way. The light comes down and the light is shining. I can stand out of the light and not get it. Or I can stand in the light and receive it. Amen. The light is coming right now. Look what it says in 1 John 3.22. It says this. Uh, Whatsoever ye ask, receive of him. Because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. So we receive from him anything that he asks. Because we, on your outline, obey his commandments. Can I say that about you all? And we do what pleases Him. Can you say that about yourself? But that's the key. That's to get my will in alignment with His will. And when we get obey His commands, the ones we do know, then He will reveal His will. He doesn't expect you to know everything. He expects you to grow and seek it and find out more, but you should at least obey the commands that you already do know. And we know that you know some. We know some that we're not obeying to. And someone once said, he knows the great desires of heavenly things, and when your desires are such that God approves of them, and when you want what God wills, and when you will have what you like then. If you do what God want what God wills, you will get what you want. And what is it? And what happens to me is that he changes the things that I want, and I'm not as interested in the earthly, secular things. I'm more interested in the godly things. So when I pray for something that's closer all the time to something that maybe God would want. And so we see that with health and direction and service and things and sharing the word. And those are the kind of things that really give us joy. We bring our sheaves in with great joy. What great joy it is to be in service for the Lord. So what is it that you really want right now? Is it more earthly things? Or is it the salvation of a son or a daughter or a grandson or granddaughter or salvation for a husband or a wife or a mother or a father or maybe even an enemy? An enemy. 
When you're right with God, your enemies are at rest with you. And when you're right with God, you have power to change the heart of your enemies. And maybe it's just someone that you know you want to try to get saved and you want them to get closer to God. But then again, perhaps you want some kind of a removal of some disability or some problem or some kind of an answer about that. Well, listen, you just need to keep praying. You just say, Lord, intervene in this situation. And he might, knock it, he might take it away, but he might leave you in it. And you can take the approach, which I hope you don't. God won't do it unless he wants to do it or when he wants to do it. But don't think like that. God told us to keep asking, keep seeking, and to do it soon. And we were to pray like this. Would you save this person now? Or Lord, would you heal me now? But you know, I always have to give that big P.S. to my prayers. Or at least I'll always remember the P.S. Not my will, but your will be done. That's what Paul had to say when God said he wouldn't heal the thorns and he, the thorns in his side. No, which I believe is blind. I mean, a bad sight from being stoned. And we see that he didn't heal Elisha when Elisha died of sickness. And we see that he didn't heal the apostles when they all died a martyr's death. And it's just like Jesus at the Garden of Gethsemane. Not my will, but your will be done. So we must remember we're in service to God. And God will deliver us from many, many things. He delivered Peter and took him out of jail and sent him to that prayer meeting we talked about. But then again, he didn't take him away from being crucified upside down or having his wife crucified as he knelt at the bottom of the cross and said, think on the Lord. Just think on the Lord, honey. Think on the Lord. And then they crucified him upside down. Was he not right with God? Yes, he was right with God. He didn't have to handle any more than he could endure. So how bad is it? We must remember that sometimes God on your outline says, wait. Sometimes God says, no. And sometimes God is looking at your heart and how bad you want it and also how persistent on your outline you are going to be. Listen to this. It shows how much you believe. Is your prayer vial full? And how much you need God for the answer. Don't give up. And don't stop being persistent in your prayers. And remember, this all prayers, all prayers are recorded. All prayers are recorded. How big is your prayer file? How big is how full are your vials? Are they overflowing right now? How many prayers have you prayed for your problem? What about your pointed prayers aimed at a particular thing or to someone to come to the Lord? Listen, do you know how many questions I told you were not answered in the Bible because they were never asked out loud? Hundreds. What is a prayer that's not spoken? What's it called? Good intentions. And you know, my dear friend, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. It's not. It's like this. No words, no power, no results. You know, it's so true that your actions and motives start in your heart and God can see your heart. Satan can't see your heart. God can see your heart. God knows what you're thinking. Satan can't see what you're thinking. But he knows. And he knows what you're doing. And he knows what you're thinking. And so you have the responsibility to put your heart into action and get results and get to work. Faith is belief with legs on it. Faith is belief with legs on it. We need to start praying some things into completion. Pray it into completion or its fullness now. Listen, prayer is a Christian's weapon. So we need to use it. Realize crisis is a chance to show your faith. Crisis is a chance to show your faith. So pray. Character is built during trials, not when things are going well. So in the bad times and in the good times, you are to pray on your outline without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. And finally, ultimately, I think love is demonstrated more often than not in a mother's love for her child. And I think it's another little closer picture of God's love for us. So in conclusion, as we keep our eyes on Jesus, let us be thankful that God has placed this great love right inside of every mother. Isn't that wonderful? The mother's love is something. I talked to my son one time and I said, well, she's got a maternal instinct. That's why she cares. He said, I've got a paternal instinct. And I said, well, it's not quite the same, son. You know, so. 
<laughs> we know that. As we keep our eyes on Jesus, let us be thankful that God has placed a great love right inside every mother. And also we want to keep our eyes on him. And we need to remember that this love is only a part of the great love that Jesus has for us. We need to thank the Lord for mothers. Let's pray that they might, with their persistence and their tenacity and stuff, and their commitment for God, would seek to guide more young ones to our great and mighty Savior. Oh, what a wonderful thing for mothers to do, and how wonderful it is that we have mothers to do it. Thank God for mothers. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for all the mothers. And Lord, I just pray that you would just put in their hearts the importance to share with their children and to just help them to come to the Lord in early, early ways. And Lord, we are just so thankful for the mothers that have this, these, this zeal for, for, for their children and the love that they have. It's just a certain kind of love that's just so close to your love, Lord, that they just know how to love. And they just... They're just they're something special about mothers, Lord. And we thank you, Lord. And we just pray that everybody knows you, Lord. And as we think on you this way, Lord, Lord, you know, just we just thank you, Lord. We hold you up. We ask for these things, Lord. We just pray that you would just bless every mother here and give them the guidance, Lord. Help them accept you. Help them to know that you were raised from the dead and that you want to be part of their life and raising your children and being in their life and being the women that you want them to be. And so, Lord, we just turn this over to you right now, and we thank you again. We're so lucky to have such a wonderful Savior. And so we thank you, Lord, and ask for all of these things, Lord, in your precious name we pray on this Mother's Day. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise the Lord. We have one last song we're going to sing, I Love You, Lord. And so if you would stand together, we're going to sing our last song, and you will be excused at that point. So here we go. Here we go. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice. <clears throat>
Thank you for mothers, and we thank you for all who have come today, Lord. I pray that you would just bless everybody really good. Give them their blessing, Lord. Anoint them with boldness so they might share your word with others. And tell others what a wonderful thing it is to have a wonderful Savior in our life. And so, Lord, we just thank you again. And I pray that you bless them for the whole week, Lord, and just keep them filled with joy that comes from knowing you. We thank you again, Lord. We ask for all of these things, Lord, in your precious name we pray, Lord, in Jesus' name. And the people said, Amen. Go with God. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you all for being here. Happy Mother's Day. I hope you have a great day today.